All right, how many of you ever came to church on Sunday night and you felt like maybe you should have stayed home? Okay, that settles it. I'm going to preach on liars tonight. <laughs> I kind of felt like staying home tonight. But I'll tell you, I got right with God before I got up here to preach, so. And, uh, you know, it, it, it does. Sometimes we do things out of routine, don't we? And we need to be careful, but do them anyways. You go to church whether you feel like it or not, because I guarantee you, by the time you leave here, you're either going to be glad you came or you're going to be mad that you came. One of the two. You're not going to leave here indifferent tonight unless you plug up your ears or do something, because I'm going to preach a Baptist sermon tonight. That's the best kind of sermon there is, a Baptist sermon. Isn't any better than that. And somebody's going to get mad at me tonight. Now, you know, if I went to a Lutheran church, I'd expect to get me a Lutheran sermon. I just would. And it wouldn't bother me any if the fellow got up and bragged about Lutherans and said that the Lutherans started in the Reformation and Martin Luther was their founder. It wouldn't bother me any because I'd know he's telling the truth. And it wouldn't bother me any if he said, you know, those Baptists over there, they're funny people. They believe in salvation but grace. They believe in being saved without being baptized or taking communion or confirmation. They believe in trusting the blood of Jesus Christ enough to get you to heaven. And that would make me mad. I read the paper yesterday on the religion page, and you know, I kind of like this pope. Now, I've said some nasty things about him, but I kind of like him. I think he's honest. I appreciate somebody that's honest. I mean, he's what we'd call a traditionalist, you know. He believes what the old-time, old-fashioned Roman Catholic Church believed. We've had a lot of popes in recent years that have been trying to, to uh, muddy the waters and get everybody together and, and uh, lie a little bit and compromise a little bit and do everything. This fellow tells it like it is. He said in a paper the other day that unbaptized babies don't go to heaven. I've told you that for years. Some people look at me cross-eyed and they say, Catholic Church doesn't believe that. They've always believed that. They believe an infant has to be baptized to go to heaven. They believe anybody has to be baptized. He also said that. I appreciate his honesty. He's wrong, but I appreciate his honesty. I mean, at least we can go out and tell people, look, this is what your church believes. I get the place anymore. I go out and talk to Roman Catholics. They say, no, we don't believe that. But they do believe that. That's the doctrine of their church. You ought not to be ashamed of the doctrine of your church. The Roman Catholic Church believes when you die that you go to purgatory and you burn in the fires. And only God knows when you'll get out. I'll guarantee you one thing. You won't get out as long as there's somebody that'll pay for masses to be said. I'll guarantee you that. I don't know how long it's going to take, but it'll take at least that long, I'll guarantee you. That's not part of their doctrine how long somebody stays in. Now, I've already made some of you mad, so I'm going to get into it a little bit more than that. Now, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. When you talk about the bottom of your feet, I'm a smelly Baptist. <laughs> but that's all right. I'm a Baptist. My feet are Baptist feet. My hands are Baptist hands, and my head's a Baptist head. Thank God everybody's Baptist head doesn't look like mine, but, but it's a Baptist head, I'll tell you that. And uh, I'm proud to be a Baptist. I make any bones about it. Now, I don't believe that Baptists are the only ones that are saved. In fact, I believe I know some of them that aren't saved. You have to be more than a Baptist to be saved. That is, I mean, you have to be saved, though, to be a real Baptist. But you can profess to be a Baptist like you can profess to be a Christian and not be one. Now, you saw one of our men tonight. I was going to say one of our young men, but I can't hardly consider Gary Molson young. But you saw one of our men tonight baptized. Been a member of this church for a long time. But he came and talked to me as other people have. Pastor, I'm not satisfied with my baptism. I believe I was baptized before I was saved. Well, then you're not a Baptist. Because Baptist baptism, scriptural baptism, believer's baptism, Bible baptism, simply means that you get baptized after you've been saved. Not to be saved, after you've been saved, to give a testimony to the world that you are saved, 
to show your faith in symbolic form that you believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you're doing it in obedience to that faith and you're doing it to become a part of that local body or that local church. That's what baptism is, as we understand it in the Scriptures. Now, uh, there are a lot of folks that are in Baptist churches that aren't Baptists. There are a lot of churches that call themselves Baptists that aren't Baptists. And we're going to talk some about that tonight. I hope you'll not be offended. I don't say these things purposely to offend anyone. I just want you to know what we believe, what I believe as a Baptist, what our historical Baptist forefathers believed, and I believe with all of my heart what the apostles taught. Now, I don't go around, and it rather perturbs me when people go around and say, well, you see, I'm a Baptist, or I belong to a Baptist church because I believe that Baptists are the nearest thing to the true church. Why, that is absolute insanity. Why would anybody want to belong to that which was the closest to the apostolic church if you could belong to the church that was apostolic? Why? I used an illustration the other or last week when I was preaching in a conference that just came to my mind. Suppose I sent my child to a school and I said, well, you know, I like that building down there. It's a very lovely facility. And I, like, I kind of like the teachers. They're very pleasant people. Now, it's not really a, too good of a school, but they have a nice facility and it's clean and it's warm and it's safe and they have pretty good teachers. Now, they don't teach them exactly what's right, but they teach them pretty close to right. I mean, you take in the math class, they teach them two and two is three. Now, that's not bad. I mean, it is pretty close. Or they teach them that uh, George Washington was the 14th president of the United States. I mean, he was a president. They're not too far off. I mean, they're pretty close to right. And after all, all I really care about is being close to right. Now, what I'm trying to say to you today, my dear friend, is if Jesus Christ founded a church and wanted us to be a part of that church, and what we believe about that church is right and biblical and apostolic, then we ought to belong to that church because we believe it's the right church, not because we believe it's the nearest one to right. Now, please understand me. I don't mean to say that we have a monopoly on the truth. I'm always careful about somebody when they say that. I'm not talking about the whole body of truth. There may be things we're wrong, and I'm sure perhaps God will reveal to us when we get to heaven that we shouldn't have done some things that we did, or we should have done some things we didn't do, or we were perhaps wrong on our interpretation or our slant for this verse or this doctrine or something else. I don't claim infallibility. I claim the Bible to be infallible. But I certainly do not claim to be infallible. So I'm sure there are some things that God will correct us on and we'll know and we'll understand. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And I, I'm sure things will be different then. And so I'm not standing before you tonight to say that there are no good Lutheran churches or Presbyterian churches or Methodist churches or Bible churches or missionary churches or denominational churches. That, that, that doesn't interest me at all. I'm here to tell you tonight I believe that our church is a New Testament, Bible-believing, Baptist church in line with apostolic teaching. Now, any church that meets that criteria, it is more than a name, but wait a minute, it is a name. And I want to clarify that first as we begin reading in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Now, we, we have the baptizing out of the way. Everything is done. We're just going to have the preaching, and we'll go home. So please don't get restless. Let's just take our time and look at this real closely tonight. Chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John... Now watch. If your Bible doesn't read like this, you got the wrong one. In those days came John the Baptist. Now, the Bible does not say John the baptizer. See, all of these men, and some of them are dear men and good men and godly men and saved men, 
But because they're a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a missionary uh, church or a Bible church or something else, they want to tell me that that doesn't really mean John the Baptist. That really means John the Baptizer. But that isn't what it says. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. John was called the Baptist before he ever baptized anyone. And John, according to the Gospel of John chapter 1, was a man sent from God. I'm not being funny or humorous or facetious when I say this. But it does not say John the Catholic or John the Lutheran or John the Presbyterian or John the Methodist or John the Nazarene. It says John the Baptist. Now, if you got baptized by John the Baptist, you would have received Baptist baptism. Don't tell me John's baptism wasn't valid. The disciples were baptized by John. They were never rebaptized. It was John who was sent from God to prepare the material that Jesus Christ would use to build his church. And he demanded that converts, after they had repented, after they had repented, to be baptized. And he was called John the Baptist. By the way, why did Jesus Christ, our Savior, when it was time for him to display his public ministry, why did he walk 60 miles to be baptized of John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Why didn't he get one of his disciples to do it? Why didn't he choose somebody out and ask them to do it? There are people that believe after you've been saved, just get anybody to baptize you because as long as you're immersed in water, you're, ba you're, you're baptized properly. That means, and again, I'm not just mentioning names, but he's a very prominent person. And Mr. Boone, who is an entertainer, professes to be a Christian, and he believes in baptism. He baptized converts in his swimming pool. Now, there, it doesn't mean that because they were baptized in a swimming pool that the baptism isn't valid. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that because they were baptized by immersion that it is valid. <clears throat> because there is more than just the water and more than just immersion that makes it believer's baptism or makes it scriptural baptism. Now, if you have received Methodist baptism, you are a Methodist. If you have received Lutheran baptism, you are a Lutheran. If you have received Catholic baptism, you are a Catholic. If you have received uh, baptism by any other group, then that's what group you belong to. Now, many of those groups will accept each other's baptism. The Roman Catholic Church did not used to, but they do some now. Almost any kind. But they would, if, if a Lutheran wanted to join a Methodist church, are you saved, brother? Fine. They don't even ask you that much anymore, but they used to. Uh, if you were a believer, if you were supposedly confirmed or saved, why, if you've been baptized, they didn't ask you how. They didn't care if you were immersed, that's all right. Or somebody sprinkled a little water on your head, or however anybody did it. They didn't care. They just, if you've been baptized, they received you. Now, Baptists have never done that. We do not accept people as members of our church who have been sprinkled. We do not accept people as members of our church who have been poured. We do not accept members in our church who have been immersed by a church that is not considered to be a New Testament church. Even though they've been baptized by immersion, even though it was after they were saved, that does not make it Bible baptism. Now, mind you, we're talking about something that has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. So, may I give you an example? If you belong to a church of Christ or a Christian church, that is a denomination, if you belong to that church, they believe that you get saved up there. That's their doctrine. Roman Catholic doctrine is, is that when they baptize you as an infant or an adult, that's salvation. The Church of Christ or the Campbellites believe 
that you have to go up there and when you go under the water, they believe in baptism by immersion. But they believe that your sins are washed away in the water. That you can't be saved without the water. That you can't be saved without being baptized. Now that is false doctrine. That is not biblical doctrine. Our sins are washed away by blood and not by water. Our sins are paid for by Jesus Christ and not in a tank, a river, a lake, a stream, or an ocean. Neither salt water, nor pure water, nor lake water, nor any other kind of water is going to wash your sins away. Therefore, even though a person came into our fellowship and said, I would like to unite with our church, and you ask him, are you saved? And he would say, yes. Have you been baptized by immersion? He would say, yes. I would say, what church? He'd say, the church of Christ. I'd say, no, you believe in baptismal regeneration, and we can't accept that in our church. Now, you know, <clears throat> we could have a lot larger church than we have if we were willing to cast those doctrines aside, as many people have. And there are people that say, well, now it's not a heaven and hell issue. It's not a salvation issue. Why do we make so much out of it? Because when you begin to cast those things aside as unimportant, sooner or later you begin to cast more important things aside as unimportant. And all of the Bible and all of the Word of God is important. I want you to remember that. Now, John the Baptist. Now, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. And verse, let me read verse, let's see, is that what I want? Matthew chapter 11. Yes, that's it. Verily I say unto you, 11, 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now, Jesus said that. I didn't say that. Now, <clears throat> Jesus said that in light of the fact that there had been a Moses, an Abraham, Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Malachi, Zechariah, Zephaniah. He looped them all together. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, um, Joshua, uh, Samson. All of the saints, all of the prophets, all of the leaders that had ever lived from the time of the Garden of Eden till the time Jesus stood preaching this sermon, and he said, I say unto you, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now, Jesus said that. All right, now, let's read, if we might. Uh, chapter 14 and verse 2 in Matthew. Brother, if I'm done with this sermon, you aren't proud to be a Baptist, you ought to go out and shoot yourself someplace. You're not fit to be hung. I'm proud I'm a Baptist. I associate with Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. That's who I associate with. Matthew 14. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. I heard a man say one time, If you were going to pattern your life after anybody, who would you pattern your life after? And he thought for a while, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, one of the great prophets. I mean, discounting Jesus because he was God. Naturally, we ought to pattern our lives after the Lord. But if you're going to choose a man out of the Bible that you're going to pattern your life after, would it be a Joshua? Who would it be? He thought for a minute and said to his friend, I would pattern my life after John the Baptist. And the man said, why? He said, because John the Baptist was the only man that was ever mistaken for Christ. They came to John the Baptist, and they said to John the Baptist, Are you he, or do we look for another? Now, I've always known that. I've known that. Not always. I've known it for years, though, and that was a blessing to me when I heard that. But I was preaching the other night 
And this came to, to my attention for the very first time. And I didn't know why I hadn't thought of something as simple as, the, as this previously. John the Baptist was mistaken for Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ was mistaken for John the Baptist. Herod heard of the fame of Jesus. He heard about his preaching. He heard what kind of a man he was. He heard of the miracles he performed. He heard of his power. He heard of his fearlessness. He heard of his compassion. He took the life of Jesus, all that he heard. He never met him because when he came before Herod for trial, he had never seen him, never met him, never heard him. He had heard John the Baptist. He was the one that severed his head because of a, an adulterous woman. But now he hears about Jesus. And when he heard about Jesus... He said to himself and he said to his servants, that's not Jesus. They don't know what they're talking about. That's John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. In other words, the testimony that he heard of Jesus was so comparable to that of John the Baptist. His preaching was so comparable. His character was so comparable that he mistook Jesus for John the Baptist. I'll tell you one thing. I've never met anybody I mistook for Jesus. I never have. I mean, there are a whole lot of men that claim to be the Messiah. There are men that claim to be God. There are men that claim to be some great... My young Sung Moon, he claims, he professes that Jesus Christ failed at his mission and he has come to complete it. And he's uh, gathered into his fold some two million followers. Idiots. Kids that are idiots. Stupid. Dumb. Ignorant. Foolish, got uh, burnt out on drugs, got wrapped up in the humanism in their colleges. That's where he's gathered them. And now they have sold their souls to Siang Moon and go out and sell his flowers and give their money and dedicate their lives. Nice looking young people, clean cut young people. Been brainwashed. Why, he's no more the Messiah than Judas Iscariot was. He's no Messiah at all. He's a devil incarnate in the flesh is what he is. Leading people to hell. Taking souls and destroying them with his false doctrine. I never, I've seen Mr. Moon. I've read about him and I've read about his escapades and his treachery and his deceit and the, the mass of his money. I never equated him with John the Baptist or Jesus Either one, brother. I've never seen a man yet that could even hold a candle that I would mistake for Jesus Christ. But Herod did. He mistook John the Baptist for Jesus. He wasn't the only one. Look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse uh, 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Whom do men, in general, tell me, gentlemen, what are people saying about me? And they said, some, not all of them, but some say that thou art John the Baptist. So there were men, not just Herod, who probably because of his burning conviction and his seared conscience thought that John had come back from the dead. But not just Herod, the disciples said, men, some, some of the men we've talked to think that you are John the Baptist. Now, some people thought John the Baptist was Jesus. Some people thought Jesus was John the Baptist. I think that's wonderful. I think that is a truth that is notable. I think that's something that we ought to stick into our hearts and our heads and say, isn't that marvelous? I don't mind if anybody calls me a Baptist. Some people are almost ashamed of it. I think they ought to be ashamed if they're not. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Now there have been many great men in history. <clears throat> Military men, political men, educators and statesmen. But there's never been a man that walked in shoe leather outside of the Lord Jesus Christ that was greater than John. I've got the testimony of my Savior for that. And that's enough. Now, of course, you must remember 
that Bible greatness is not measured the way we measure greatness in our lifetime. Let me read just, uh, I wanted to read more, but I'm only going to read verse 15. Now, if you want to read about John the Baptist, you read Luke chapter 1 and, and the entire chapter, and you'll get a pretty good picture of John's life. But I'll, I'll conserve time because I have so many things I want to say. Let me just read verse 15. For he shall be called great in the sight of the Lord. Now, I don't believe that if you want to be called great in the sight of the Lord, that the world's going to call you great. I think if God is going to call you great, the world is going to call you weird. And the world is going to look at you as rather odd and peculiar. That's what Jesus said about his people. That's what Peter said about the believers, that they would be a peculiar generation. If you want to be great in God's eyes, I don't believe you'll ever be great in the eyes of the world. John the Baptist was never considered to be a great man. He, he's, a, he's not a notable man in history. You'd probably have to scan every history book that was ever written in the first couple of centuries of the Roman Empire to even find his name or even mention of it. Why, you have to, you have to dig and delve into history books. History books that deal with the 1st and 2nd century B.C. and the 1st and 2nd century uh, A.D., you have to dig into those history books to even find mention of Jesus Christ. The world never looked upon these men as great. I want to tell you something. The world does not look upon Jesus Christ today as great. They never have. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the people that go to his church. I'm talking about people who go to church and speak his name. They don't consider him great. Many of them consider his mother greater than he. They don't really consider Jesus Christ great, and they certainly don't consider John the Baptist great. I mean, if you're going to equate yourself with somebody that you want Bible greatness, then equate yourself with the person or persons that the Bible calls great. Now, it says that John would be great. In the, in the second chapter of Luke, it says Jesus will be great. Now there's that word used to describe both these individuals. Well, you say, that's not hard to understand. When you ascribe it to Jesus, he certainly was great. And yes, he was. But Jesus said John was great in the sight of the Lord. Now, why was he called great? Was it, be, uh, was it be perhaps because his birth was foretold? I don't know, as my birth was foretold, I'm sure it wasn't, and very few people's are. But way back in the Old Testament, the Lord, 400 years in the book of Malachi, 400 years before John was born, God Almighty prophesied through his prophet Malachi that he would be born, 400 years before he was born, that he would be the preparer uh, to show the way of the Lord, 400 years before his birth. I don't think that's what made him great. Was it because he had a miraculous birth? He certainly did. His birth can be equated in many ways to that of what I preached on this morning, to, uh, to Isaac, because Elizabeth and, uh, and her husband were old, well up in years, past childbearing age. And read this story and you'll find out that it was really a miracle. John's parents. His birth was really a miracle, like Samuel's, like Isaac's. I don't believe that's why he was great. Was it because he was related to Jesus Christ? You know, according to the flesh, he was Jesus Christ's cousin. For Elizabeth and Mary were related. And in, in fleshly, in human genealogy, Jesus Christ would be related to John the Baptist and John the Baptist to him. I don't believe that's why. Was it because he was a separated man? Some people get upset with our church and get upset with me because I preach so much on separation. You know what I say? <laughs> You're not going to tell me what to preach. Nobody's going to tell me what to preach but God. The only people who get mad are women that want to go around dressed the way they want, men that want to live and act the way they want. 
and young people that are rebellious and people who want to live according to the authority of God. They're the only people get mad about, upset about. John was a, not only John was John the Baptist, but John was a separatist Baptist. He was a separate, look at uh, verse 15. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> you won't long live for God if you drop your standards. I'd rather be too strict than have our standards too high as be like a bunch of these panty waists around today. You go to church and you can't tell if one's a man or one's a woman. And the kids are rebellious and run up and down. The aisle. I've been in churches where I was preaching and, and have three or four kids run up and down the aisle. And scream and holler and jangling keys, playing with toys and everything else. And parents just let them go. And if a parent or an adult dares to say something to one of them, I'll get cussed out. I'm talking about I've been Baptist churches like that. Why, that's ungodly. That's wrong. That's wicked. That sin is what it is. Brother, I want to tell you something. If you don't like separation preaching, you're not going to want to stay in this church very long because I'm going to preach on it. John was separate. But now let me make it abundantly clear. That isn't why he was great. None of these things. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why John was great. Let me tell you why we ought to emulate him and follow him as we would follow the Lord. Let me tell you why we ought not to be ashamed of our name or called by the name Baptist. Let me tell you why we ought not to be because John the Baptist was great. He was mistaken for Jesus and Jesus was mistaken for him. First of all, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, he didn't jump over any pews. He didn't scream out and babble in an unknown tongue. He didn't roll down the aisle. He didn't fall on the altar. He didn't foam at the mouth. He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. You know, I, uh, I read one place where when Dale Moody was here on this earth, and Dale Moody was one of the great preachers. Now, Dale Moody wasn't a Baptist. Now, as I said, there's something wrong with all of us. Dale Moody wasn't a Baptist. He was a great man. He was a great soul winner. He loved, he loved God. He was a great preacher. He turned two continents upside down for God. But uh, <clears throat> Dale Moody was in a revival meeting in Philadelphia one time, and along came one of these little panty waist preachers that was upset with him and jealous of him, really, because he was drawing great crowds and having huge numbers of converts, and this other fellow's church wasn't doing anything. And he kind of said something like this, Huh, you'd think that D.L. Moody had a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. Whereupon another brother answered, he said, No, the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. That's what the difference is. You will never be great in the eyes of the Lord until you are filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. May I remind you with all of my heart, I believe and have taught and preached. The Holy Spirit of God is a person. I don't know any other word to use to describe him. Personal pronouns are described to him. It says in the book of Ephesians, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Now there are cults that believe the Holy Spirit is just a power. An inanimate, be an inanimate power. They don't ascribe to him the personal pronouns and personal qualities, knowledge wisdom, leadership ability, the ability to be, to be grieved, the fact that he's called uh, by uh, pronouns, personal pronouns, and so on, many other things. The Holy Spirit of God is a person as Christ is, as God the Father is. And the Holy Spirit, beloved, today, in this church age, or this age of grace, in this dispensation, the Holy Spirit of God lives within the body of every believer. If you have been saved by God's grace, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, and Jesus Christ said He would be in us forever. He'd never leave. So He's there. Now, you don't get pieces of a person or parts of a person. The Holy Spirit of God indwells you, lives in your body. But have you surrendered your whole body to Him? Or is He crowded out? 
inside your being. Do you say, Lord Jesus, God, my Heavenly Father, I know I'm saved. I know I'm a Christian. I know the Holy Spirit lives within me. I thank God for everlasting life. And I know I ought to do certain things, but there's some things that I want to do that I'm not supposed to do. And so I want to tell you, God, you can have my religious life and my work life and my home life and um, this life and this part of my life, but my social life, well, there's some things there that I, I just want to crowd the Holy Spirit out. See, John the Baptist never drank wine or strong drink. He was separated. Separated Baptists don't drink liquor of any kind. They don't drink alcohol. They do not drink it. They don't have anything to do with it. They know it's bad and it's wicked and causes men to do evil things. And they stay away from it. Now, I know there are probably people in our church that drink, probably members of this church that drink. But you do not represent the Cleveland Baptist Church. You do not represent the Cleveland Baptist Church. And you may make fun of it. And you may laugh about it. You may think it's unimportant. But John the Baptist was a separated Baptist, and he didn't drink wine or strong drink. And Jesus Christ didn't. And I believe that's important. I believe that's indicative. If we want to be what we ought to be in the eyes of the Lord, then we ought to emulate those that were great in the eyes of the Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ and His forerunner, the one who prepared the way, John the Baptist. And I believe if you're a Baptist, if you're a real Baptist, if you're a Bible-believing Baptist, if you're kind, the kind of Baptist you ought to be, that you're going to be a separated Baptist, and you're not going to drink wine or strong drink. That's what I believe. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you know, beloved, tonight, you cannot be great without being filled with the Holy Spirit? And did you know tonight that it is a sin not to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit as long as you want to please yourself and please the flesh and do what you want to do and be unwilling to give up. I know people that have little things that I preach against that they, they count those so important they'd, they'd almost die, they'd almost leave the church, almost go someplace else. That's so important to them. Why, man, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, why, you'd give up anything. You wouldn't care about things to you would not be important. Only serving God would be important. John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit. He was great in the eyes of God. Secondly, he was a soul winner. He was a soul winner. You say, I want to be great in the eyes of the Lord. You could be a preacher and be a great orator. You could be a great teacher. You could be... Uh, a tremendous uh, influence for the Lord. In many ways, you could be a faithful church attender. You could give your tithe, your offering, give to missions. You could do all the things Christians are supposed to be. You could live a separated life. But my friend, if you are not a soul winner, you will never be considered great in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 16, chapter 1. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Proverbs 11.30 says, He that winneth souls is wise. Third, he was humble. It's hard to think of this man as humble in many ways, but he was. I don't think that John was the life of the party. I don't think that John had the greatest personality. The average person probably that was around John wouldn't have liked him. He, he probably prayed too much. He was probably too religious. And he probably read the scrolls too much. He probably praised the Lord too much. He probably spoke out against evil too much. He probably didn't want to have fun too much. There were too many things about John that would not appeal to any kind of flesh. But I believe in all sincerity that John was truly a humble man. Now, there are people <clears throat> that have a wrong idea about humility. There are people that say, oh, don't mention my name, or don't do this, or don't. And what they're really saying is, be sure you do. 
There are a lot of people that put on a humble act. Like they're just so wishy-washy and so milk toast that if somebody came up and slapped them across the face and hit them in the stomach and kicked them in the shin and knocked them down, they'd lay there and bleed and say, God bless you. That is not humility, that is stupidity. <laughs> Some guy take a swing at me, brother, I'm going to take a swing back. Now, I want you to know that. Don't test me on that. I'd, I'd hate to do it, but I'd do it. I mean, God Almighty, listen, God Almighty, you read his Bible, he said you've got a right to defend yourself. You respect your life as you'd respect somebody else's life. And you not only have a right, you have an obligation and a responsibility to protect your family if it means to kill somebody to do it. You have an obligation to do it. That's not humility. We didn't get to that portion in the book of James. We probably will Wednesday night. But it says if you want to be humble, if you have true hum humility, you're humble before God. And you know what he says if you're humble before him? He'll raise you up. He'll raise you up. Listen, men fear John the Baptist. You don't usually think of somebody that's... Usually we think of humility as being meek and mild and quiet and insignificant and not saying anything and not demanding anything and just kind of just shriveling, shriveling up and just hiding in the corner and I don't want anybody to notice me. Is that what John the Baptist was? Man, he was a thunder for God. He was, like, he was like an earthquake when he came out and preached. He had the power of God in his life. And when he came out, even Herod feared him. The king feared him. The soldiers feared him. The people feared him. The chief priests and scribes feared him. They were afraid of John the Baptist. But he was humble before God. He said to his disciples, he pointed to Jesus and said, He must increase, I must decrease. That's humility before God because he knew Jesus was God. He didn't say that to Herod. He didn't say that to the soldiers. He didn't say it to the chief priests. He didn't say to anybody on this earth, Look, fellas, I want to take a lower position. Uh, you be the head cheese. I, I don't really, um, I'd rather not preach. Get somebody else to preach. I, I'm, just, I'm just shy and humble. And I'd, I'd rather not. Man, when I go to a fellowship meeting, if they don't ask me to preach, I'm disappointed. I want to preach. I sit there and listen to those guys and I enjoy it, but I feel like I can do a better job. And I'm just waiting. Why don't you call on me to preach? Man, I'm ready to preach. I don't know humility about that, brother. I want to preach. John didn't sit there and say, somebody say, oh, he's just so humble. He, he never wants to preach. He'd just rather somebody else preach. And he'd just rather listen to somebody else. Means you can't do it, probably. Means he knows he's not very good. Man, John didn't do that. There wasn't an ounce of humility that those people could see in him. He thundered the voice of God. When, when, when John was there, there wasn't anybody else that preached. He did the preaching. And he, and he poured it out, his heart. But when he came before God, he said, he must increase and I must decrease. He humbled himself before God. Not only that, John was great because he was a Baptist. I believe that with all my heart. He was great because he was a Baptist. Somebody said to me one day, he said, why, you, you talk so much about Baptists and you're so Baptist and everything. He said, what would you be if you weren't a Baptist? I said, I'd be ashamed of myself. I'm not a Baptist because I was raised a Baptist. I'm not a Baptist because I was taught Baptist. No, I'm not a Baptist for that reason. I, I was, I, we went to other churches when I was a boy. We went to the Presbyterian Church, went to the Mel Trotter Rescue Mission. I am a Baptist tonight because I am absolutely, thoroughly convinced by the Word of God that the Baptist church, the local New Testament, Bible-believing, soul-winning Baptist church that follows this scripture is the church 
that Jesus Christ found it. Now, that's why I'm a Baptist. Now, if I was a Lutheran and I didn't believe the Lutheran church is the right church, I'd get out and I'd find the right church. If I was a Methodist, I didn't believe the Methodist church is the right church, I'd get out and find the right church. If I was a Baptist and didn't believe the Baptist church was the right church, the church that Jesus founded, the New Testament church, then I'd get out and find the right church. That's what I'm saying. I'm a Baptist all the way. Now, people talk about Baptist distinctives. I know there's a lot of confusion, and I know there are a number of shades of Baptist. I won't tell you this today. Baptist is not a denomination. If it was a denomination, I'd get out tomorrow. I'd change my name. I wouldn't be a part of it. Baptists are not a denomination. A denomination has control. No denomination has control of this church. Nobody outside this church but the Holy Spirit of God, the New Testament, and the members of this church have a right to say what goes on inside this church. Nobody else. And if they did, then it'd be a denomination, but it's not. A true Baptist and a true Baptist church is a local assembly of believers who adhere to the teachings of the apostles, who believe Jesus Christ is the head of that church, who believe the Holy Spirit is the administrator of that church, who believe the New Testament is the bylaws and governing function of that church, and that no one outside that church has any control over that church. That's what a Baptist is. That's what a Baptist is. And I'm a Baptist all the way. Now, some people think, well, you know, Baptists, you have Baptist distinctives. And I agree with that. Don't misunderstand me. I heard a fellow say one day, he said, well, you're not a Baptist if you don't believe in sovereign grace. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I believe in sovereign grace with all my heart. It's the only kind of grace there is. There isn't any other kind. Doesn't have anything to do with being a Baptist. Of course I believe in sovereign grace. I believe God knows everything. I believe God's all-powerful. I believe God can do anything. I don't have any trouble with that. A lot of that's just theological nonsense is all it is. And then people come to the ordinances. Now, I believe baptism and communion are important. That's why we teach people to be baptized the proper way, proper administrator, proper authority. That's why we teach people who should take the Lord's Supper and who shouldn't. Open, close, close, close communion, baptism by immersion. Those things are Baptist distinctives, but they're not all. Let me tell you what a Baptist distinctive is. It's getting people saved is what it is. Getting people saved. Because to fulfill the Great Commission, you got to get them saved first. Before you do anything else, you got to get them saved. Now, I'll tell you something. There isn't, there isn't a church... I don't believe in this city. There is not a church in this city, in the history of this city, that has ever won more souls to Jesus Christ than this church has. Now, all those people have not become members, and all those people have not gotten baptized. But I'll tell you one thing. We believe in winning them, whether they ever come to this church or not, or whether they ever get baptized or not. We believe in winning souls to Jesus Christ. Because you can't fulfill the Great Commission unless you have that first Baptist distinctive, and that is winning lost people to Jesus Christ. Now, you can call yourself a Baptist. You can call yourself a Christian. You can call yourself anything you want to. You can use whatever na name or title you want to. But unless you live up to the meaning of that name, that name is meaningless. So if you say you're a Baptist and you don't live a separated life, you say you're a Baptist, and you don't win souls. You say you're a Baptist, and you don't have any humility before God. You say that you're a Baptist, and you don't do these things, then it tells me that you're just using the name, and you're not really a Baptist. John the Baptist was great, just because he was a Baptist. John the Baptist was great, because he was willing to suffer. One of the greatest problems we face in Christendom today is this sensitiveness that people have. My word, there are people by the hundreds that at one time came to our church and they parked their feelings on either shoulder. And all it did was take one statement, one thing, one act, one little thing, and they were gone. I'll not go back. I'll not go back. I'll not go back. They were gone. You know why? They're not willing to suffer. They're not willing to pay any kind of price. 
What in the world is going to happen when this church begins to suffer? This church has never suffered. Certain individuals, certain members have gone through a great deal of suffering, but this group of people as a church have never suffered. What's going to happen when they suffer? How much is it going to divide us and how many are going out because they're not really in? God help us today. Listen, I'm proud to be a Baptist. You know, Jesus said the disciples came to him and they were talking about John the Baptist on one occasion. And he said to them, he said, what went you out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Let me tell you some John the Baptist more than that. He's an iron being. Well, he had, more, he had more iron in his backbone than most railroad tracks do. You couldn't, bend, you couldn't bend that fellow when he believed something. He believed it. You couldn't bend him or get him to compromise. That's what Herod tried to do. That's what Herod tried to do. He heard about John. He liked John. He went down to hear him preach, the Bible said. And he heard him gladly. And I'm sure some of the members of John's congregation kind of said to him, Look, John, the king's here today. Take it easy, will you? I mean, let's don't be... Nice. I know people, you know, somebody, somebody to bring a Catholic friend to church, and I'll get up and, and say something about the church or the Pope. And they'll, they'll say, oh, why'd the preacher have to say that today? I got my friend with me. Because I want your friend to hear the truth. That's why. That's why I didn't do it to make your friend mad. I didn't. Listen, he can go to any church in town and hear that, that pollywog stuff. He can go any place and, 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 and get varnished over. He can go any place and get a little honey in his mouth. I can take him any place and get that. But old John was a preacher. And they came and said, now, now John, now John, the king's here today. I mean, can't you just one, don't you have one sermon on the love of God? That you, you could just kind of tone the thing down and just be nice today? You know what John did? He stood up said, Herod, not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. You're living in adultery. Well, it was quiet that day. But he preached it. He lost his head for it. Thank God, though, brother, listen. When the disciples went out to get his body, headless body, and they buried that old body in the tomb, when that wicked Herodias lifted the, plate, lifted the top of that charger, and there was John the Baptist's head. John the Baptist was neither in the tomb nor in that charger. He was already with the Lord. You can't destroy a man of God. You can't destroy a Christian. You can't destroy a believer. Now, dear people, understand me. First thing you need to do is get saved. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you need salvation more than you need anything else. You couldn't be a Baptist if you wanted to be if you're unsaved. You need to get saved. More than anything else, we as Baptist people are concerned about your soul. If you never come back to this church, if you don't like this preacher, you don't like Baptist people, God bless your heart. Get saved anyways. We're concerned about you getting saved. And I want to tell you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, sprinkled, poured, or immersed, Man, you can, get, you can get baptized to the polywogs, know your social security number. You'll never get to heaven. There's no way. And you can, listen, if you're here tonight and you think you're going to heaven because you belong to a church, or you've been baptized, or you do good, or you're kind to your neighbor, you're going to die and go to hell. I'm telling you the truth tonight. You need to get saved by, by faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But if you're here tonight and you're a Christian, and you've never been obedient to the Lord, Brother, you ought to be, I'm telling you, you ought to be a Baptist. That's what you ought to be. You get some backbone in you and you take a stand for God, say, I'm going to get baptized the right way. I'm going to live for God and belong to this church. I'm going to take my stand for Jesus Christ. You do it tonight. Let's bow our heads in prayer.